Good morning, Glendale. Happy Sunday. I was reading something that said, may you feel like you belong. And I said, I, I really like that. But then God turned it around and said, may you feel like you belong everywhere. May you feel like you belong. May you feel like you belong. You belong in the world. You belong for the family of God. And you belong here in the family of Glendale. Stephen gives us a bulletin every Thursday. And this Thursday, I saw a picture which I thought was little glasses of tomato juice. And it turned out to be little candles that Kyle had put on the table. And I said, I have asked people for nine months to join with us and light their candle. Well, I have never joined with you to light my candle. So as Stephen lights this candle for us to join together, I'm going to have him light, my hands are shaking, my candle because I belong and you belong. Here is the candle, Glendale. Here is the candle for us, for me, from me to you. And I ask you to prepare your hearts and your minds as Ryan and Courtney light our Advent candle of peace. Good morning. Last Sunday, we lit the candle of hope. Today, we light the candle of peace. Lighting this second candle reminds us of the complexity of what it means to feel peace this year. With a year full of uncertainty, anxiety, and fear, the candle of peace invites us into a safe and secure space where we can just be. As we light the candle of peace, we acknowledge the times this year when peace has felt too far away. We acknowledge the times when our peace has felt insecure. We acknowledge our shared desire for your safe presence of peace as we continue in our Advent journey. O come, O come, Emmanuel.
you marry Kate. Let's continue singing with It Is Well With My Soul. confident that you are coming, bringing a world where we will all be made right. Calm our anxiety, strengthen our patience, and keep our hope aflame as we work towards and wait for your new day. Amen.
Well, hello everyone. I'm not sure if the mic is working, but there's green light on. All right, that's good. Oh, I forgot my paper. <laughs> oh, I got my mask on too. Well, what else is going wrong this morning? Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the stream. And we at Glendale UMC want you to know, no matter where you've come from or where you are going, what you believe or what you may be doubting, what you're feeling or just not feeling, no matter the color of your skin or who you love or how you identify, all of you is welcome into this community of faith by a God who loves and knows you by name. Thank you. Thank you, David. We are blessed to have David um, serving regularly in worship with us. He's usually doing behind the scenes work for us, but I'm glad that he was able, able to give the welcome message this morning. Um, we have a few prayer requests to lift up this morning. Um, as you've probably heard, COVID is now the leading cause of death in our country. Um, so of course we continue to pray for all those who are affected by it. Um, and I will lift up, there's a couple families in our church who've had positive test cases for COVID this week. Um, so far, I've only heard that they've had mild symptoms, um, but please keep them in your prayers. Um, I'd like to lift up Kelly Hargis and her family. Um, Kelly lost her uncle this past week, um, so we grieve with her and pray for their comfort. Um, Stephen and Josh have a friend named Jake Jones that they have asked for prayers for, so we lift him up in our prayers as well. Um, and then I'd like to also lift up um, the St. Thomas nurse who was killed this week. Um, and we continue to pray for an end to gun violence of all kinds. So let us now go to the Lord in prayer. God, when the time was ripe and the hour had come, you sent your servant John into the wilderness to proclaim the coming of the one true Messiah. Make way, repent, and be baptized, for the salvation of God is at hand. John came to bear witness to the true light, the Messiah, the Son of God, and he told them, wake up, watch, and wait, for the hour is near when the Son of God will arise. God, on this second Sunday of Advent, we have heard your servant crying out to us in the wilderness. We have heard the call to repentance and restoration, and we want to respond. We have heard that you are offering forgiveness of sins, and we want to hear your mercy spoken over us. We have heard that you are baptizing with water and with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Cleanse us and make us new. We have heard that you are ushering in a reign of peace, and we want to see your kingdom when it comes. God, our sins are many, but your mercy is great. Our vision is dim, but your coming is at hand. Our hope is feeble, but your promises stand forever. God, your world stands in need of you. Everywhere we look, we see need of you. For your coming, your restoration, your peace, your transformation. On this second Sunday of Advent, we pray for the nations to know your truth and your light. We pray for the poor, the hungry, and the needy. We pray for those who are spiritually hungry and poor in spirit. May they come to know the living water and to drink deeply from your well. We pray for those who face Christmas alone or sick or homeless or destitute. Jesus Christ, light from true light, be a light in the darkness. And we lift up all the prayers mentioned before for those struggling with COVID, for those who are victims of gun violence, for those who are experiencing loss during this time, for those in need of healing. God, the hour of your coming again draws near. Make us ready in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls. Lord Jesus Christ, come to us again this Advent. Come and do not tarry. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen.
Our scripture this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the darkness or in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Last Sunday was the beginning of the church liturgical year, which begins each year at Advent. The liturgical calendar goes in a three-year cycle, each year focusing on a different one of our synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John doesn't get its own year, but is instead sprinkled throughout the other years. We are in year B, which means that our focus gospel this year is the gospel of Mark. Every year on the second Sunday of Advent, if we follow the revised common lectionary, we hear the story of John the Baptist crying out to prepare the way of the Lord. This year is no different. However, when we get closer to Christmas, we will have to set Mark aside for one important reason. Mark doesn't include the birth narrative of Christ. Imagine for a minute what it would look like if Mark were the only gospel account that we had. That would mean there'd be no shepherds, no manger, no frankincense and myrrh, no infant Christ at all. And it makes me sad to think that without the accounts of Matthew and Luke, families might not gather at the end of December, churches might not sing Christmas carols, and Santa Claus might not even come. Although not being a parent myself, I'm a little iffy on where Santa fits in to the Christmas story. So. If you are at home with your family, you'll have to discuss that after the service. Mark is considered to be the earliest gospel account in our Bible. It was written some 30 years after the death of Christ. So it may be that the author hadn't yet heard Jesus' birth account, or maybe he chose to ignore it, which I often do with texts that seem troubling and I'm not quite sure what to do with. But for whatever reason, Mark jumps right in with John the Baptist, starting only with an introductory sentence that alerts us to the fact that this is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. For Mark, that good news starts with John preparing the way, calling people to repentance. What happens next is that Jesus shows up, John baptizes him, then Jesus goes out into the wilderness where he is tempted by Satan, then he calls the disciples, and then he begins healing people. And I'm not really leaving anything out of that account. This is really what happens in Mark's gospel in rapid succession. Whereas Matthew and Luke spend a significant amount of time preparing for Christ's birth, they've got prophecies and genealogies and visits from the angels, all to help explain this miraculous baby born of a virgin who will just barely escape the wrath of Herod when they flee to Egypt. But none of that history is in Mark. When Jesus first enters the scene, he is baptized by John, and the Spirit descends on him. This is a remarkably different story. And I wonder if this account changes the way that we prepare for Christmas this year. Perhaps the Gospel of Mark should serve to remind us that what we wait for on Christmas morning is not the eight pounds, six ounce infant baby Jesus that Ricky Bobby prays for in Talladega Nights. It might not even be 30 something Jesus that enters the scene in Mark to be baptized by John the Baptist. 
this year, I think we may just need full-on risen from the grave, death-defeating Jesus. If I had to guess, and this is, of course, just a, je- a guess, when Christ returns, it will not be in infant form. In fact, I doubt that it will be in human form at all. And that gives me some hope. So while we celebrate that Christ was born on Christmas Day, we prepare for something that is much more than that. So even if your house looks like Clark Griswold's this year, or you've managed to affix Frosty to the roof like the cranks, and even if you are spreading Christmas cheer by singing loud for all to hear, I don't think that those are quite the preparations that we are called to do during this season. Now, I'm not saying that these things are bad, especially if they bring you joy. We could all use a little joy this year. But when our houses are decorated, presents are bought, and cookies are baked, we may just find that we aren't actually at all prepared to receive Christ. John the Baptist reminds us to prepare the way, to make his path straight, and he urges us to prepare through repentance. It might do us all some good to spend some time this Advent season considering the things that we may need to repent of this year. Because if there is anything that has been revealed through this pandemic and through this election cycle and through the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and others, it is that we are all complicit in this unjust system that our society has created. We are all in direct or indirect ways play a part in these systems. So only by examining ourselves and repenting of our wrongs can we truly be prepared for the coming of Christ. I saw a segment on the news this week about trying to prepare people to receive the COVID-19 vaccines. And it talked about how many people are so reluctant to get the vaccine And they pointed out that one population in particular that is very hesitant and resistant to get it is black people. Now, as a white person, I couldn't understand why they would be resistant to the vaccine since black communities have been some of the hardest hit by the coronavirus. And as a white person with a degree in science, I was also unaware of a study that the CDC did from the 1930s to the 1970s where they studied poor black sharecroppers. And they promised uh, the people in the study that if they participated, they would receive um, free healthcare. Um, But during the study, they discovered that, I think 399 of these poor black sharecroppers suffered from syphilis. But throughout the study, and even after the study was over, they never told any of them that they had syphilis. And even though the cure for it was penicillin, a drug that is easily available, they never offered it to these men. This is a completely unethical study um, and would be completely unacceptable in today's standards. And for contrast, I'll tell you that I'm participating in one of the COVID vaccine trials. And one question I asked my researcher before I got my shot was when will I know if I got the vaccine or the placebo so that I can get an actual vaccine? And his response was that once it becomes available for my demographic, which will probably be five or six months out, they would either let me know if I had received the placebo or give me the opposite shot of what I had gotten so they could continue the study knowing that I had at some point received the actual vaccine. Because as my researcher told me, And I quote, to not let you know if you were vaccinated, to not give you the opportunity to be vaccinated would be completely unethical. So you can understand why black people may be hesitant to get a vaccine shot, knowing what has happened in our past. I think if that story were part of my past, and in some ways it is, I too would be hesitant to get a shot. But here's the thing, our safety, our ability to get back to normal, the ability of teachers to get back into their classrooms, the ability of our parents and grandparents to get back to their social lives, 
our ability to gather here in this sanctuary and worship as one big family cannot happen without a significant number of people being vaccinated. I think they say that the number is about 70%. They need 70% of people to get vaccinated before we can start to get back to normal. So we cannot do this without black people. We need them. We, of course, need all of our white people to get vaccinated as well, everyone who is able to get a vaccine. But we cannot do this without our siblings of color. So this year, this Advent, as you prepare not only for baby Jesus, but also for the Christ who was killed for our sins and who rose from the dead, maybe it's time to think about what things in our own lives, in our collective lives, in our society, need to die as well so that we can be raised to new life with Christ. As we await the coming of Christmas, we need to repent of the ways that we have been complicit in the mess that we are now in, because it is only by truly admitting when we have been wrong that we can ask the Messiah to come and help save us. May we all prepare the way. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the Messiah that you sent on Jesus on, on Christmas morning. And we thank you that Jesus did not stay a baby, but grew up um, to save the world. Lord, today we repent of the ways that we have not loved our neighbor and we have not lived out the call that God has for us. Help us to lean in to you, Christ, to see the ways that we have been wrong, to make reparations for those mistakes, to ask for your forgiveness. And Lord, help heal us and prepare us to once again receive the Messiah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, if you would like to make an offering, we invite you to do that online. I now invite you to sing with me, Star Child.
few announcements this morning. First off, we have two birthdays to celebrate this week. Julie Filder has a birthday on Tuesday, and Richard Pittman has a birthday on Thursday. So we wish you a happy birthday. If I didn't uh, share your birthday or anniversary that's coming up this week, please comment that in the comments or send us an email. We would love to celebrate alongside of you. Um, if you've recently started joining us for worship, um, there's a link to our online connection card. We would love for you to fill that out. It's in the post on Facebook, or if you're watching on our website, um, it is there on that page if you scroll down a little bit. So uh, we hope that you'll fill that out and let us know that you are joining us for worship. We have more Advent devotional cookbooks that Steph and Ashley put together. So if you'd like a printed copy, if you haven't already received one, they're outside on the porch. Uh, we'll mail you one or we'll deliver it if you live nearby. Um, I know Paul Hudak, who joins us all the way from Ohio, uh, received his in the mail and was thankful for that. So um, the reach of Glendale reaches far outside of the greater Nashville area. So um, if you would like uh, one of those uh, to have this Advent season, please let us know. Um, there's been interest in a social group uh, to meet when it's cold on Zoom. So if you'd like to be part of that, uh, we have a Bible study, prayer group, a book club. But this would be kind of a, a different group that there's no real, um, yeah, I don't know, uh, just for social fun, I guess, uh, just to get to know one another better. Um, so if you are interested in something like that, it might meet uh, weekly or monthly. Um, that's to be planned out. But if you'd like to be part of something like that, please uh, message us and let us know. Uh, last but not least, um, our Christmas Eve, I'll be saying it every week just to keep uh, reminding, um, is uh, we're having an outdoor Christmas Eve service um, since uh, there's no way we could um, have everybody inside. So um, I'm hoping and praying for weather like last Christmas Eve. I think it was like 65 degrees outside. So it definitely didn't feel like Christmas outside. Um, but just in case, we'll have some heaters outside um, around the lawn. But we hope that you will join us on Christmas Eve for our candlelight uh, Christmas Eve service at 4 p.m. And that's Thursday, December 24th. I think that's all. I'll also share with you that our devotional, Advent devotional cookbooks have been sent to West Virginia, to Wisconsin, to Minnesota, and Montana. So wherever you are, if you'd like one, let me know, and I'm happy to send those out so you can have one this season as well. Um, I've been studying some sign language this week because I wanted to keep teaching you some. And so um, the word that I'm excited to teach you this week is peace. Um, and it's a little bit more complicated than you may think. Um, it actually involves kind of putting together two different signs. The first sign is to become. Um, so you take your two palms, put them together, and flip them over. So this is to become. And then the second word is either calm or quiet. Kind of, kind of like this, if you think of like calming someone down. So to become calm or quiet, that's peace. And I want you guys to practice that and learn it this week because we're actually going to use that next week in a longer phrase to say, peace be with you. Um, so I think it might be a neat um, kind of devotional experience, prayer experience this week if you are able to at least once a day say peace and maybe say a prayer um, for someone in your family or someone in the community, maybe perhaps for yourself as you think about the peace of Christ this week, so go in peace.